Hello, welcome to the MC, the media committee of the Democratic Central Committee of Shasta County. Um, my name is Ed McCarthy, and I am here today with Fork McGowan to talk a little bit about what went on on the USS Theodore Roosevelt and what happened with Captain Crozier. It's been on my mind lately. I followed some of the stories as they went on, and it um, just didn't seem like the right way to, to, to treat our military staff. And um, I found out, recently gotten to know Quark a little bit and found out that he has a background in the Navy. So love to hear a little bit about what your background is and what your history is. Okay. Well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, um, I grew up in a Navy family. My dad was a 30 year career Navy fighter pilot and my mother was a, a, a Marine. They met in World War II and, and got married and she was obviously a, not a Marine when I was growing up. But um, I spent my whole life at home uh, as part of a Navy family. And <clears throat> my dad um, was a test pilot. He was the commanding officer of a, of a squadron in Barbers Point, Hawaii when I was in, in uh, seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And then he was, um, he retired. He was deputy commander fleet air Caribbean. So he was the second commander of the whole Navy forces in the, the air forces, Navy air forces in the Caribbean sea. Caribbean, in the Caribbean area. And so he retired as a Navy captain. We traveled a lot. I was in 12 different schools by the time I got out of high school. And I went to a high school in uh, Honolulu and uh, Southern Maryland with, at the Naval Air Test Center, Patuxent River uh, for my sophomore and junior year. And then I graduated from high school in Taiwan where my dad worked for the Taiwan Defense Command. And from Taiwan, uh, from high school, I went to, um, I got an appointment to Annapolis. And so I went to Annapolis in uh, the summer, actually June of 1964 as a member of the graduating class of 1968. And so it was difficult for me to get through the Naval Academy. I'm not an engineering guy. I was more history, government, uh, English kind of guy, but I got through there, got a degree in Naval Science. And um, my first assignment after getting out of there, I went to anti submarine Warfare School in Key West, Florida, for several months. And then I reported aboard my first ship in the fall of uh, probably November of 1968 as the anti submarine Warfare Officer, uh, the John W. Thomas MDD 760, out of, um, it was out of San Diego. And shortly after that, we, um, we deployed to Vietnam for, for the first time, and we did mostly, um, we did gunfire support where we were in the South China Sea and we were shooting in support of ground forces, you know, on the Vietnam, uh, you know, on the mainland. And then also we did what's called plane guarding where we would, when the carriers would launch and recover aircraft, we would uh, be behind as a safety uh, for, for rescue of pilots going in the water. So the primary rescue was a helicopter. The secondary rescue was the destroyers. And so we did plane guarding. And I was over there, we were there for six months. And then I came back and was <clears throat> reassigned to a second ship. And I later found out that the people, all the people in the second ship were handpicked because it was a brand new, um, a, a destroyer that had been modernized, the Morton DD-948. And so I had the same job there. I was the um, <clears throat> anti-submarine warfare officer. We'd undergone, a, a, again, a modernization where we were the first ship in the Pacific to have this uh, we had this bow-mounted sonar. We had a new ASROC system. Uh, and ASROC was a anti-submarine warfare rocket. And it could either have a torpedo or a nuclear depth charge on its tip. And so we had to, we were the first one of our, of our type in the Pacific. And we would, had to write all the doctrines and get all, you know, get it all set to, uh, you know, to go off to war. And so we were in the, sh in the shipyards in Long Beach for the first few months. Then we um, we went over to Pearl Harbor where we were home ported. We were there for a period of time. And then we deployed to uh, Vietnam. And again, we were on the gun line and plane guard. And then, so this was your and second tour? This was the second That was my second tour. Moved to the Sea of Japan. Uh -huh. No, the South China Sea. South, I'm sorry, South China Sea. That's all right. <laughs> South China Sea. And <clears throat> so, I, I, and again, my main job was anti submarine warfare officer. But my main job over there was called uh, the GLO or gunfire liaison officer. 
which I had also done on my first ship. And that meant I was in charge of the ship when we were directing gunfire onto the beach. I had control in, in, in what they call combat, the Combat Information Center, CIC, and we would control the gunfire um, to targets on land after being helped by uh, spotters, either in an airplane or on the ground, and, and we, would, we would shoot. We had five and 54s on that ship. They were big guns. Oh. And so we did that for a while, uh, you know, for several months, <clears throat> and then um, through a whole series of, of events, I decided that uh, I did not uh, support the Vietnam War. And so I turned in a letter of resignation. I had a, a five-year obligation because of the Naval Academy. Um, and so I turned a letter of resignation and uh, got sent back to Pearl Harbor on temporary duty to await a response to that letter. And so the letter was denied. And I wasn't trying to be a conscious objector. I just disagreed with the Vietnam War. Anyway, I, the letter, I spent two or three months, I spent a couple months at Pearl Harbor, then I got sent back to the ship. And um, we... You were in several years by this point, right? So you were... In yeah, a, I was in about three and a half years by now. Okay. And so I went back to the ship, joined the ship in Subic Bay, and then we came home by way of, you know, home being Pearl Harbor, we came by home by way of Darwin and Sydney and Auckland and Pago Pago. Um, and then back to Pearl Harbor, and then I got off the ship. And the remaining time in the Navy, I was the uh, special services officer at Pearl Harbor. So I was in charge of the golf courses, the swimming pools, and so forth, and ended up my career um, at, at Pearl Harbor, you know, on shore duty, um, and got involved in, in a bunch of the human resource programs that were going on. There was a guy named Admiral Zumwalt who had taken over as the chief of naval operations, and he was trying to modernize and update the Navy. And, um, I was working for a, uh, the commanding officer of the Naval Station was a colleague of my father's. And so he called me in and just told me he, you know, as long as my views about the war didn't interfere with my job and I did my job, everything would be fine. And so I ended up getting involved in a lot of different programs. Uh, I was a white representative on the Minority Affairs Council. Um, I got involved in the, in the, in the drug abuse program uh, as a counselor and as a, uh, liaison between people who wanted to uh, be admitted to the program and then uh, the program itself. Um, that, that had to be really useful. I mean, that, those are big changes, yeah. I think, at the time, the integration of, of mm -hmm. different, you know, folks from different backgrounds. And I know that, you know, my, my father was served in Vietnam at the very beginning as a Air Force, um, mm -hmm. in the Air Force as a uh, mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I know some of his experiences, you know, definitely knew a lot of folks who had drug problems and came back and had a lot of difficulty processing and living with their experiences that they had over there. Uh, my father, right. exception, you know, he definitely had some problems in the 80s, mm -hmm. in part as a result of some of his experiences in Vietnam. So, you know, helping soldiers in that way is definitely had a lot of value. Yeah, yeah. And, and being in the Navy, at least the Navy I was in, it was a lot different than being uh, in country, like the Marines of the Army, we were we were not that definitely being on a ship off land was a whole different experience. But there were people that uh, mostly enlisted men from submarines who had a hard time being on the submarines and being underwater for six months. So a lot of them would turn themselves in, and then there'd be other people for different reasons. You know, each individual reason that would that would turn themselves into the program. Hmm. And I ended up, um, and so that was my last year or so in the Navy and. It was, it was exciting, it was enjoyable. Um, when I was on the ship, I was, the, the, they had, a, I was a division officer, Fox Division it was called, and that was Sonar, Sonar and ASW weapons. And so we were in charge of the, of, of again, on, on the second ship, particularly the ASROC, which was a very big deal because it was a new, had a nuclear capability. And I probably had 30 people that worked for me at that point. And then when I was at special services in Pearl Harbor, probably a hundred, there were military and civilian. And we had a large organization that put on events and then again, had swimming pools and a couple golf courses and basically all the recreation facilities at Pearl Harbor. And it was actually, uh, it, even though I was there kind of for punishment uh, because I wasn't su supporting the war, it was, it was a fun job and it was one that I, you know, ironically it would have been fun to stay on longer and, and continue doing because I, get, I did get to do so many different kinds of things.
And I ended up working with a bunch of different groups because we were doing um, base, what they call base beautification. And so I got this money from, from the captain of the Naval Station and we would use it to get different groups to clean up parts of the Naval Station and then also to do planting. And we got Job's daughters, we got the chief's wives, the officer's wives, a bunch of different groups. And then I would have these people that had gone through the drug program that were waiting for uh, their assignment. And there were usually five or six of them. And we would use the special services trucks and they would go around and maintain everything that had been planted. And, and they would take care of it. So we had these big weekend activities with all these volunteers. And then I had uh, this group I called the um, drug, they're at the drug abuse crisis intervention team. And so they were basically the people that would go around and, and take care of everything. And that lasted right up until I left. And like I said, it was quite enjoyable. And then I got out of the Navy and went on to do other things. Yeah, that, um, that decision to, you know, speak up against the war had to be a difficult one. I know my father didn't have real huge objections to the war, but you know, he, uh, he was over there, I think, earlier. He was there as a military advisor before it was sort of officially a, a war. And, um, you know, he, they ultimately gave him the opportunity to go serve in Germany instead and extend his enlistment period and move him out of Vietnam. And he was not enjoying what he was seeing there. He, I have to say, I, I do remember at least one story. He was not a fan of base beautification. He was <laughs> there at Hans Newt Air Base and he wanted to see some more defenses and thought things were yeah. getting more dangerous and did not want to see more plantings on the runway. Um, yeah. You know, I think it was because he, you know, that, that was part of why he wanted out of, mm. of uh, Vietnam was things were getting more dangerous. Mm. It was, uh, attacks were more frequent. And um, I don't think he felt there was a great deal of, uh, he wasn't really motivated by the bigger overarching political question of should we be there and rescue this country? It, it was more, hey, there's people dying on their side and our side. I'm, I, I want out of this. Mm -hmm. So, and the Air Force was able to move him to Germany and mm -hmm. he was also able to get out. So well, that's good. what were some of the main sort of motivations to that got you to decide that it was time to put in that letter of resignation. I, I can't imagine that was an easy choice for you. No, it was not. It was not at all. I mean, I was sit down for, you know, I didn't know if they would uh, kick me out right away or what they were going to do. And um, I even got down to trying to figure out if I could make my last car payment. because <laughs> I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what was going to happen. And then my, I, I, I was overseas. We were on the gun line around the time that it happened. And my parents, my dad had retired and they were, traveling around North America in an RV. And I knew I would have to, at some point, you know, have a conversation with them about it. But um, I had a background in form, formulations at the Naval Academy. So I'd studied the history of the Far East. And um, I read a lot about it. And actually my senior year in high school in Taiwan I was when I first heard about the Vietnam War. We, were, we would go to the CYO, these Catholic Youth Organization meetings and at one of those meetings, they had a speaker who was, had come over from Vietnam and was talking about how the Viet Cong were shooting at water skiers um, off, you know, somewhere off the Vietnam coast. And that was my first awareness of Vietnam. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is I had a context because living in Taiwan, we were, under, we were there under Chiang Kai-shek. So this is in, the, in uh, 63, 64. Um, and it was a... He was a dictator. They had come over there in 1947 or 48 when Mao Zedong and the communists drove the nationalist Chinese and Chiang Kai-shek over to Taiwan. And Taiwan at that time had been um, separated from China since the 1850s. Formosa was a Portuguese colony at one point. And so they came over and, and the Taiwanese weren't very happy about it. And they, the nationalists basically went around and machine gunned people down on the streets and just took over. And we were treated well because we were Americans, but the Taiwanese were definitely second-class citizens being ruled by Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang. So I had an experience of living under a military dictatorship, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so that created a context and the Naval Academy. And I just had, always had an, an interest in, in the Far East and, and history there. And so I just uh, was aware um, of the French occupation after the Second World War and Dien Bien Phu and the history 
of you know how we got in Vietnam in, involved in Vietnam, and I just felt it was the wrong the wrong place at the wrong time, and that we shouldn't be there. And the only thing I what ultimately led me to resign was I realized the only thing I had control over was me. I, I couldn't I didn't have control over the foreign policy. I didn't have control over anything else, and so I just said, okay, you know I I can't be part of this. Or I don't want to be part of this. And so I did not, um, again, I wasn't a conscious, object, conscious objector. I'm not against all wars. I think, you know, wars are there. That's unfortunate, but they're, you know, they're there. And it was just this war. I had real problems with it. And so I felt later, I felt I was vindicated by history and people have different views about it, but uh, that's what I felt. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, you know, that difficulty, yeah. of, you know, trying to follow your conscience and trying to do what, what's right even under just difficult circumstances, that's some of what um, got me interested in what went on on the Theodore Roosevelt. And the captain of the aircraft carrier found out that some of his sailors uh, had come down with coronavirus mm -hmm. and that the best way to protect them was to get them isolated and to get them away from each other and get them out of these tight quarters. Mm -hmm. He tried to request that of his supervisors and, and didn't get a response. He knew that the timing was critical and that we needed to take decisive action right away. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, since he couldn't get his superiors to agree to that, he wrote this long letter and he emailed it off to, you know, 10 or 15 people. It's unclear on exactly how many, none of them in the media, saying that, hey, we need to get the ship into port. We need to take off most of our sailors. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to isolate people. We need to find out who's got this disease. Uh, before people start dying, and we need to do it right now. Mm -hmm. And someone else, not Captain Kozier, leaked that memo um, to the press. It then became a story, and you know, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is a little bit of history, but you yeah. know, the, the ultimately, you know, his decisive action did get the Navy to do exactly as he recommended. The ship mm -hmm. was put into port. Most of its sailors were taken off in quarantine and ultimately they found whatever 800 to a thousand people had the disease even with that yes. decisive action um so including the captain who got relieved yep he he suffered through it and they did have mm -hmm. one death as a result so mm -hmm. ultimately the way that i see it is his actions saved lives on his ship and mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, because it made public news and because it made the president look bad for not taking decisive action earlier, uh, the acting secretary of the Navy, this Thomas Maldley fellow, decided he needed to fire uh, Captain Crozier and remove him from command. And uh, the admirals didn't recommend that. It, it wasn't, um, at least for the people that were serving under him and the people who were directly in command of him, they didn't agree with that decision. Um, but Thomas Maudley decided that he needed to make that decision. Um, so what was that? Did you have the same take? I mean, did, did you see it sort of unfolding that same way or I think I've got most of the facts, right? Yeah. Well, remember, let me know. Part of, you know, a big part of it is the political, politicalization, politicization of the military and, um, <clears throat> the military. I mean, everything obviously is politics, but the military has tried to stay out of politics. They're supposed to, you know, defend the country, serve at the pleasure of the commander in chief and so forth. But there has been, under this commander in chief, there has been um, meddling uh, that has never occurred to this level before. And part of Modley, Modley's decision, as I understand it, was that he felt or he believed that Trump wanted this guy fired because he made Trump, he made somebody look bad. Mm -hmm. And so he mildly fired him because he figured that's what Trump wanted. And what I've come to, what I've read, uh, and there could be different, obviously different versions, but what I've read is that Trump basically initially supported the decision to fire the guy because he made him he made somebody look bad. And then when Trump saw the uh, backlash from, you know, the support of the captain by the crew, and then the backlash in the media, that his tone kind of softened. Mm -hmm. But Modley, I think, 
kind of sealed his fate by going over and then uh, telling, you know, spending, I don't know, yes. tens of thousands of dollars to fly over and make a speech. Yeah, it was like $2,000 to fly over there to get him to the ship so, so he could directly address yeah, it. Yeah, to talk smack about the captain that or the crew obviously demonstrated that they really admired. And yeah. so Modley got fired. One of the it's interesting. That, one of the Go things ahead. that really stood out to me in that speech when Modley was there is, you know, he, he gives the crew advice. You know, he's trying to tell them about right. And what he says is, you know, my, my best advice to you is don't ever be, don't ever worry about being loved for what you do. Rather, love the country that you are asked to defend. Love the Constitution you pledged your lives to protect. And importantly, love the people you are ordered to lead. Make sure they eat before you do. Care for, the, for their families as much as your own. Be invested in the success, in their success, more than your own accomplishments. Nurture their careers more than you pursue your own advancement. And value their lives to the point that you will always consider their safety at every single decision you make. And I find that incredibly ironic that he would stand there and tell this crew that, well, that was exactly what his previous captain had done that he made a decision at his own expense, at realizing that it may cost him his command, but it was the thing that was right for the sailors under his command, and it was how he could best be loyal to the oath that he took um, to our country. And the fact that Modley would get there and say that and not see the irony boggles my mind. Yeah, uh, well, it, it seems like this administration has, has a habit and they do it a lot of, of saying things like this and then doing and then doing just the opposite. Uh, most of these people have never been in the military. They are chosen, at least as far as I can tell, they're chosen out of loyalty to to the president. Yeah. Um, and if Mod they Mod cross him, Mod he fires him. Said as much at one point. One yeah. of the things that he said when about you know why he made this decision was that uh, the previous secretary of the navy lost his job because the Navy Department got crossways with the president. Said he didn't want that to happen again, so he moved quickly to fire Captain Trojan against the express wishes of the Admiral. So it's again, on one hand, he's saying, you know, put the advancement of your staff ahead of mm -hmm. your own political admissions. And then on the other hand, he came out and said, you know, I did what I had to do to save my own job at the expense of a very good captain. Right. Well, and the previous the previous secretary of the Navy, who was also acting uh, as this guy was and as the current one is now, got fired because Trump pardoned a war criminal. Uh, he pardoned a SEAL, been, had been accused of, a, of being a war criminal. Mm -hmm. And then the Navy after that uh, wanted to. Um, they wanted to demote basically him. demote this guy in his retirement, take his I think it's a trident, take his trident away. Mm -hmm. And Trump overruled that. And so here Trump is you know, interfering um, in day-to-day -day affairs of the military. And so the latest instance now with the recommendation that was put forth on April 24th by the Chief of Naval Operations and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Acting Secretary of the Navy to the Secretary of Defense um, is all sitting on you know, a desk trying to figure out whether or not uh, Trump is going to intervene again. And that's totally inappropriate. Yeah. So the, in my the, view. the recommendation, I believe, is that uh, Captain Crozier get reinstated to his previous position. That's, that's correct. So now it's up to the political folks at the top. Now, I know when this administration came in, they promised that they would have the best people. Now, one of the things I thought recently was, <laughs> you know, my background's in science. Defining yeah. our terms is one of the important things. And best is sort of a vague term. And it seems to me what they mean by best is those who will be the most loyal to this administration. Now, that's not my idea of what a best candidate is. So I, to me, that talks a lot about leadership. And from your experience in the Navy, what were some of the qualities that you find to be in the best leaders? It, for me, it certainly isn't, a, you know, unblinking loyalty to, you know, the current president. Um, yeah. So what, what do you see? What have you learned about leadership? What are some of the qualities that you think are most important? Who is the best? Yeah. Well, training, uh, competence, uh, courage, uh, good decision-making abilities, 
um, being able to think fast on your feet, um, respect of your colleagues and the people, you know, up and down the chain of command, the people that you work for and the people that work for you, people that uh, a, a, a leader on a ship, for instance, who doesn't have the confidence of his crew um, is going to just have problems. There'll be turnover problems. There'll be problems with stuff breaking down, um, all sorts of things. And, and the second ship I was on, as I said, I, I learned later on that all the people have been handpicked and I the surprise I was in the group, but I did learn that from a, a, you know, a very reliable source. Um, we really worked hard and put in extra time and tried uh, every, did everything we could to succeed. And we were in a very difficult period whenever a ship is in a shipyard, it was a very, very difficult period. And then we had to basically write all of the training manuals, all of the procedure manuals. We had to write everything because we were the first ship again of its kind in the Pacific fleet. At, at that time. But we did it because we respected the captain, we respected the executive officer, uh, and the other people that were on the ship. We were, we were a team, and we did a lot of, uh, we worked hard, we worked hard together, we were, uh, it, it was fun, and uh, because we had a good leader. Um, that really helps, and you know, yeah. when you know that your leader, like Maudley, you know, is only loyal to making the president look good and not right. as loyal to the crew and not as loyal to the mission and not as loyal to you know our armed forces, I think it becomes very difficult for folks to follow a leader like that. I think Yeah, I agree. Well and you know through history there's leaders you read about the Civil War and all the generals that uh, Lincoln went through before he finally got to Grant. Um, and, and the same you know, the Second World War, there were basically four admirals that turned the tide of the war uh, you know, in the Pacific. You hear about Halsey, uh, but there were people, also being a leader uh, requires being a visionary. You've got to look, look to the future, what's going to happen next, anticipate problems. And being, you know, not having experience in the military, with the military, not having experience as a leader, except being a political hack, does not serve our country well. Um, yeah, I generally agree, and that's you know why I've been so disappointed with the current leadership and the current folks that are you know being put in place in our military and in our government is they're not the people who are, at least in my opinion, the, the best mm -hmm. able to lead. They may be the best at putting out a soundbite. They may <clears> be the <throat> best at at spinning a situation for public consumption, but as far as getting a job done and being effective, they really don't appear to be the best. And I sort of wondered if there were any similarities. I, I, did you serve under Nixon? Was Nixon in office? No, I was under um, Nixon. I was out by the, actually, so I was there. For, yeah, so I did serve under Nixon. So I was on active duty from 68 to 73. So I did serve under Nixon. Did, did, were you aware of any of that sort of political corruption that went on at the time? I feel like there was a lot of it in government back then, like there is today. It wasn't as obvious. I think it came out afterwards, like with the Pentagon Papers and so forth, that that all changed. But in, in the environment I was in, um, I, I was not aware of corruption. Uh, we were just out there doing our job. You know, we had to struggle sometimes We'd, we uh, did, uh, to get parts for the sonar because we could only carry, we were only allowed to have so many parts, and we knew this particular tube would break down more often than not. We needed to have spares. So we do stuff like that. But like on both the ships I was on, when we were doing underway replenishments, you're uh, 80 to 100 feet away from another ship that's usually a lot bigger than you are. And we're taking on fuel, we're taking on weapons, uh, or, or we're taking on ammo, you know, we're taking on big bullets, these five inch projectiles, and the powder cans that went with them. And the officers would be involved with the crew in getting that stuff below decks and getting everything stowed so you could break away because you want to be next to the ship you were doing the unrep with you, you want to be next to them as little time as possible because again you're you're out in the ocean 80 to 100 feet apart and if you get too close there's going to be somebody killed hmm. yeah that's some tricky stuff so some of the things we're talking about with leadership is some of that stuff the things that have stuck with you from your experience going to annapolis and serving in the military or do you feel like that those experiences when you were young? Is there 
are there aspects of that that have sort of affected your worldview and your you know how you look at leadership and, <laughs> yeah like i could talk for a long time about that but but yeah i mean basically I'm a, it's a real easy question yes and and i um in my own career uh after the navy uh i was a leader in the navy by definition an officer and a gentleman by an act of congress um and and i was in leadership positions and i did you know i did experience leadership both as a leader and um and from above and uh you know i made mistakes you learn from your mistakes you move on but later on in life i um <clears throat> i got into the labor movement and i was a leader of i worked for the shasta county employees employees association for 19 years where i was learned uh, basically uh, it was baptism by fire uh, i got hired uh, in Prop 13 passed two months later, and I was in that job for 19 months, or 19 years representing county employees, and I was there. Um, I did bargaining, I represented them at the Board of Supervisors, I was a public spokesperson, I was a public face, and I pictured myself as being out in front and kind of going like this to get them to do things that I thought would be in their best interest, and then I would run behind, then I have to push, uh, you know, to get them uh, to, to come along in, in the way that I felt was was the most helpful and, and, and productive for them. And then after that, um, I got a similar job. And, and, and so when I was with SCEA, the Shasta County Employees Association, I was the staff. It was myself and two other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were kind of their leaders and we had an elected leadership, but we would try and guide them and give them ideas and then make decisions and do what they told us to do at the same time trying to guide them because I was in fact a professional. So, and then in the last job I was in, uh, the California Teachers Association, I had a similar job, but I was uh, part of a staff. I was here in Reading in this job for about 18 years. And it was just, it's a membership, it's an organization of over 300 teachers. And we were one of a whole bunch of offices all over the state, but, but I was in a similar position kind of because we were so remote. And while we would carry out the duties assigned to us from above, you know, political campaigns, education, training, and so forth, um, I was the one that interacted with the local leaders and again, would try and persuade them, um, you know, within certain boundaries to, to do certain things that again, were in, were in their own self-interest. And in a lot of cases, you know, I was their face, I was their guide, and I would be, you know, kind of going like this and kind of going like this at the same time. Um, and so I had to be a leader in those situations. I'd have to get, you know, gather information, educate myself about issues, make suggestions, uh, narrow some decisions down to a list of, of decisions, and then work with groups to pick the best one and then do whatever I could to work with people to get those decisions implemented. Sounds like the, that, that leadership style of pointing the way and then encouraging people to, to keep going. Sounds like that goes way back, all the way back to the Naval Academy. And some of the yeah, really? <laughs> and I actually had my first organizing when I was at Pearl Harbor, organizing all these groups to go out and plant stuff and clean, clean up the base. And I didn't realize that until years later. But um, yeah, I mean, leadership, you, you need to be able to work with people and, and listening is a big part of that. And and getting their ideas and helping them feel empowered. Um, all of those, I mean, there's there's lots of different kinds of leadership. There was a, um, the class I was in, 68, uh, there were some famous people. One was uh, Jim Webb, who was a senator from, from Virginia. He was Marine Corps pilot, and he was actually the secretary of the Navy under Reagan. And, um, He's written several books, uh, uh, you know, in his experiences as a Marine. So he's very well thought of as a leader. Another one was a guy named Charlie Bolden. Charlie's African American, and so this was he was our class president for two of the four years uh, that I was there. He's and um, this was in '60 in the mid '60s. It was a very white elitist institution. There were probably ten uh, African American kids that were in our class. Only two, only two survived to graduate. The, the rest of them got run out. So Charlie went on to become a um, Marine fighter pilot. Um, he was the first black astronaut. He was the head of NASA under Obama. 
Wow. He was at the reunion. Ollie North was at my reunion too. He was in my class. I did not like him then. I don't like him now. I have no respect for him at all. I got my picture taken with Charlie Bolden. So, so. <laughs> good guy worth, worth being with. So yeah. before we wrap things up, any other thoughts on the USS Theodore Roosevelt that I haven't covered that you wanted to get in? Well, not directly, but, but one thing is um, it's, it's real easy today for people to be patriotic and quote unquote support the military and you know, put a flag in front of their house or put a flag on the truck or something drive around town. But less, I've read a number of articles that talk about, and I'm being generous here, but less than 5% of the American public knows anybody or, or has a, a relative that is part of the military. And I think that is a big problem because one of the big factors that drove the whole anti-war movement in Vietnam and also made Congress and the president much more aware of the public sentiment was so many more people had skin in the game. With the draft, people were in the military, they, they had relatives in the military, they knew somebody in the military, and, uh, they were much more involved and concerned about what the military did and, and how they lived. And today, with so few people having a direct connection with the military, it's fun to read about it in the newspapers, but you don't think about what happens when we go to war, what, what war means. And again, I'm not saying any particular war is good or bad, um, but if there were more people that had skin in the game as far as the military or even some kind of national service, I think we would have a whole different dynamic going on in the country today with regard to the way the military are treated and uh, with the seeming ease at which decisions are made to go to war without the public caring one way or another because they're just told to go shop or put a flag out or do something nice on Veterans Day. And I think that needs to change. And if it doesn't change, then things will continue to be as they are, just get worse as far as respecting the military and being involved in decisions about war and peace. I, I definitely agree. I've, I've thought that for a while, that you know that there's such a small percentage of people who bear so much of the brunt and the responsibility and the consequences of these very long wars that we've had going on. Um, yeah, that if, you know, if, if it was really more people's brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. um, I did have a stepsister that was in, uh, and her husband were both in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, I do think people's opinions would change. You know, I also found, you know, if there's um, cosmic irony or, if, you know, there, <laughs> there, a, there may have been a little bit of God's intervention that all, all of this happened on, on the Theodore Roosevelt, because there's a great quote out there from Theodore Roosevelt where he said, patriotism means to stand by the country. It does not mean to stand by the president. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, that those, that quote about patriotism really rings true in this situation. I agree. Well, thank agree. you so much for your time, and thank you so much for your service, and thank you for all that you've done for Shasta County, and uh, okay. we'll talk to you more in the future. Okay, likewise. Thanks for taking the time for the interview. Take care. Be safe. <laughs>